Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Nutanix, Sadish Nair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, if you are watching us on the live stream, thank you so much. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I'm happy to see that the room is almost full. The way I see it, there are at least two distinct advantages of doing a conference like this in DC. One, like yesterday Dheeraj said, almost all of you are here, and I think most of you are not drunk, right? <laughs> most of you, I say most, because if, if you went to Jason's party last night, then probably you're not here. And if you are here, yeah, I'm sure you are hungover. And the second one, in any other city, a nerd herd like this will not be the coolest one. But in DC, when you compare to those politicians, we are the coolest bunch. <laughs> so if you are single, want to mingle, go to a party, to bar, you can actually say what you do for a living and people will talk to you. <laughs> Look, how was yesterday's keynote? Yeah? I didn't ask just for an applause, but I know that some of you are still a bit confused with the velocity with which things just came down within a compressed time frame. And some of you are probably thinking, I don't know what just happened. What is Zai? What is calm? I am calm already. <laughs> the mysteries of uh, calm and Zai, I know that we need to solve it a bit more. And that's what we're going to do today. Today is a day we'll try to solve some mysteries of life. As we know, the life is full of mysteries, right? Some mysteries are hard. Some mysteries are easy. For example, here's a hard one. What exactly does a DJ do in the club? <laughs> Look, he looks busy, he's got a lot of stuff, he's got earphones on, he's acting very serious. The music is already playing, what the hell is he doing there? <laughs> no one knows. In fact, some of the DJs also don't want you to know what they're doing because they themselves don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I'll give you another one. This is a really hard one, this guy. You switch on TV, change any channel, you can see his face, but people have no clue what his real talent is. <laughs> Zero clue. It's another hard mystery. Very hard to solve. Look, I am not trying to solve any of these mysteries, but there's another mystery. That's about NASDAQ. Everyone knows the name. I think some of you probably trade there, but do you really know what goes inside that building? I don't think, like I said, even Sherlock Holmes can solve the mysteries of Ryan Seacrest, but this one I think we can solve. We have the right person for this. Let's welcome 
the CEO of NASDAQ, Mrs. Adina Friedman. Thanks, Anish. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Wow, Ryan Seacrest, he is a big mystery, isn't he? No one knows. <laughs> no one knows. People try, but they gave up. Well, we have a much simpler task this morning, then. Let's hope so. <clears throat> Look, I think uh, to prepare for this one, I did some research, because I didn't know what the history of stock markets were. And uh, to be honest with you, I was surprised that the, the idea of stock trading, commodities trading, it all started almost 700, 800 years ago. And I found a photo of one of the world's first stock exchanges somewhere in Europe. And the business of stock trading through exchanges hasn't changed or ha didn't change until significantly until 1971 when NASDAQ came out with the world's first all electronic stock exchange. Talk about disrupting an industry, right? So my question to you is, how do you lead a company like this with such an awesome, awe-inspiring history through a time where everything is changing around us in technology? Sure, well, it's really interesting. We, uh, in addition to having the US markets, we also own and operate the markets in the Nordics and the Danish exchange. If you go to uh, Copenhagen, one of the biggest buildings in Denmark, in Copenhagen, is the original exchange building. And it has a ramp for, you know, basically the horse and buggy to bring all of the goods up into the exchange. Because back then it was, you know, here I'm going to give you a good and I'm going to exchange it for another good. But, um, but today, obviously, stock trading, uh, commodities, equities, options, futures, they all happen by computer. And NASDAQ really was the first exchange company to introduce the concept that all of those people running around the floor, throwing tickets on the floor, can actually be automated and organized and into a network um, that can become modern. I never understood that thing about throwing stuff on the floor. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, neither did I. Uh, but I think that if you look at what we do today, me most of the stock trading decisions are done automatically. And what's interesting is to see where that value chain is moving up into in terms of automation, which we'll talk I'm talking about it in a minute. But disruption is something that is in the DNA of NASDAQ. But it's interesting, when a company is disruptive and then becomes very successful, it's, it's hard to continue that disruptive culture because you start to have a lot of success, you start to make a lot of money, and you start to get comfortable. And then you start to get afraid. You're afraid of disrupting yourself again. You're afraid of, of uh, disrupting that success that you're having and the money that you're making and you start to get and move into the mode of being incremental instead of continuing that disruptive path. And I, and I think NASDAQ has gone through that in its life. You know, frankly, 1971 is 46 years ago. Yeah. So uh, we've been around a while now. And it's been interesting to see the phases of our existence over What you time. just mentioned is probably applicable to the entire audience here, right? I always say that if you want to play, play like you have nothing to lose. But the problem is you do have <laughs> things to lose. So how do you... Right keep that momentum when you are the leader, how do you continue to play like you have nothing to lose? So it's really interesting because I, um, as I took on the, the role in, in January, one of the first messages I gave my team was, okay, just let go of your fear, mm -hmm. right? So we are in a very disruptive period of time in our industry. We've got the cloud, we've got the blockchain, we've got machine intelligence. Yep. There are a lot of disruptive trends. And I want to be the one who's disrupting the industry. I want to be on the forefront of that. I think NASDAQ, frankly, we are on the forefront of those trends. But the key is that you can't be afraid to embrace those in the context of realizing that it might disrupt part of what we do. So the first thing was let go of your fear. Think about it in terms of what's the right thing to do. Yeah. Think about it in terms of what's the best opportunity for our clients. Mm. And then we can, we'll, we'll find a solution. We'll yeah. find a way to make it work within the contract of our business, but let go of the fear. And then the second thing is, we have a, essentially an R&D budget mm -hmm. that is separate and distinct from the operating budget. Mm -hmm. And we do that so that our leadership can come forward with new and exciting and disruptive ideas and not kind of disrupt their budget. Yeah. <laughs> so, in a way, so you kind of do it outside the budgeting process, you have it available to you to be able to come forward and come yeah. up with something innovative. And then the last thing we also do is we have a venture investing arm. 
So we oh, have a group yeah. that goes and makes venture bets. Yeah. And that obviously gets us in front of a lot of disruptive companies. Yeah. Like, I think it's kind of uh, good to see the Wall Street asking not to be afraid because you are part of Wall Street, <laughs> and most of the public companies are afraid of Wall Street, right, to a certain extent. Um, let me ask you about the automation part that you talked about. Um, every time when the stock market, let's say, takes a small crash, and you open up a Financial Times or Wall Street Journal, what's the first photo you see? A bunch of stock traders with their hands on the head, paper everywhere. Most of them looks like they are from um, New Jersey or uh, Brooklyn, <laughs> right? Yelling and screaming. You, when we walk into NASDAQ, you don't see that. No. You don't have a pit like this with paper everywhere. You automated the hell out of all of that. I mean, it's very interesting to us because you removed people from trading floors, NASDAQ, and Nutanix, we are sort of trying to figure out how to remove people from data center who are doing right. repeatable tasks. Yep. What's the future of automation? What exactly will the kids do when they grow up? I mean, uh, Tesla is talking about automating trucks. Amazon is going to automate the grocery checkout. All services jobs looks like it's going to be automated. What are people going to do, and what's the future of this? Well, I think that if someone knew a perfect answer to that question, <laughs> they'd, uh, they'd actually do really well in the stock market. Um, <laughs> but, but I actually would say this. I think that it is an uncertain future. But my view of the future is that there's always going to be man and machine together. And so when we look at how uh, stock trading occurs today versus how I see the yeah. future of the industry, a lot of trading decisions are made through algorithm and automated. Invest, um, I would argue that index investing is an automated form of investing because yeah. you're basically choosing a basket of securities by rule, mm -hmm. not by individual judgment. However, I, there are still a lot of people in the industry. Mm -hmm. So what are those people doing? They're, they're creating the algorithms. They're managing the algorithms. They're back testing the algorithms. They're surveilling the markets. They're making sure that we're compliant. So there's a, there are still, an, it's an enormous industry with an enormous amount of talent. The talent's are shifting to different skills. Now let's look at what we see going forward. In the investment industry, um, and that's an industry that I, I know pretty well. It, the history of it has always been people, people and judgment. They take a lot of inputs, use their human brain to make a human judgment, to make a decision to invest. Mm. That is also starting to get disrupted. So yeah. you've got the passive investing with indexes, and then you have a, certain companies where they don't have any investors, they have data scientists. Yeah. 700 data scientists managing $45 billion. Right, and they're taking massive amounts of data using Nutanix's um, amazing capabilities, uh, scaling thank, it up. Thank you for the play. <laughs> and essentially driving to an investment decision. And I talked to the, one of the guys who runs one of these firms, and I said, well, what about human judgment? Like, I, don't I matter as a CEO? Doesn't, it ma like, doesn't a human who's running the company matter? My job as to your, Yeah, <laughs> as to make sure that you make a good investment decision, don't you want to meet the management team? And his answer was, well, it'll all come out in the data at some point as to whether or not you're a good CEO. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, um, I think Is that- Is still working with you? Or <laughs> <laughs> and I actually think at the end of the day that automation will augment the human brain and the human judgment, not necessarily replace it. So I think there will always be some investors who make that choice. But if every investor made that choice, it would be a huge herd mentality. And then there would be these humans over here who would arbitrage that herd mentality and they'd make a lot of money. So I actually think there's always going to be a balance. Mm. Um, there's going to be some that automate every investing decision and there are going to be some that always make human judgments. But I think the vast majority of the industry will end up being a combination. Mm. And they, they call it quantum mental investing. What is it? Quantum mental. Okay. So you take quantitative information and inputs the to make a stuff, fundamental yeah. investment decision. And that's kind of a little bit of a hybrid of man and machine, yeah. just like the hybrid cloud, yeah. right? A hybrid. Yeah. Um, and I do actually think that that's the future of the industry. This is a, so you heard what she said. If your kids are not data scientists or algorithm writers, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so Nutanix and the NASDAQ, like you mentioned, have a really good history because one of our best uh, moments in the company's past happened there. It's a beautiful story. I think we broke the record a number of people. Yes, you did. Hopefully no one will break. A, yeah, that's fantastic. You are there in the middle. And uh, 
before that, Nutanix and Nasdaq also had a vendor-customer relationship, more of a technology partnership. How is it working out? Please don't tell me if it is not working out well <laughs> in front of everyone. In front of all of you. Yeah. No, it's working out. Fan. It's working out incredibly well. So I would say there are a few things. One is that um, we originally worked with you to make sure that we were look, um, basically able to do um, a lot of real-time analytics on our own system yep. performance and making sure we were tracking and, man and monitoring our systems appropriately using the N N Nutanix capabilities. And the HCI stack yep. has really enabled us to do that because we, we have so much data that we're processing every millisecond yep. that it allows us to make sure that our systems are performing. But that's just the beginning. So where we are taking the, the company next, and one of the things we're going to talk about is we don't just operate our own markets, but we provide the technology that powers over 90 other markets yep. around the world. That's and, a piece that I think most people probably don't know about, right, Nasdaq? And that's one of the things that we really are, we define ourselves as being the technology leader in the industry, and that therefore all these disruptive technologies are very important because one of the things we just built was a, a market that's fully deployed in the cloud. Um, that is uh, blockchain enabled end to end, and that will you know, basically be a totally new architecture of what markets are gonna be. Across the world, they take your technology as well, right? Pretty and cool. so it's really interesting to see, but most of our clients, as well as ourselves, are likely to move into the hybrid cloud model. Mm. You know, there's gonna be a lot of data sovereignty issues. Yep. There's gonna be a lot of, um, a little bit of fear, frankly, of moving everything up into the cloud. There's also proximity issues. But that hybrid of being able to have some things on-prem and some things in the cloud and a scalable architecture, and Nutanix, frankly, gives us all of the, that capability with the HCI capabilities to make it so that we can um, create that hybrid cloud model for ourselves, yeah. which we're doing with our DR, our disaster recovery, as well as for our clients. Fantastic. I mean, Aztec is all about performance and security, and the fact That's that right. we can even associate our brand with that is a phenomenal honor. Anything else, that, any last words for the audience? Well, I would just say that it, it is an amazing a moment in, in the history, certainly of our industry, but I think of every industry in terms of the pace of change, the pace of disruption, the all, but also the opportunity that we have with the technologies that are here today. If you think about the, what, not just Nutanix, but the whole infrastructure that we are we're moving towards in terms of having it be highly scalable microservices with a platform type of um, underpinning, it kind of opens up the possibility to do things that we never thought was possible. And I think that every industry is facing that moment, but it really is an exciting time. You know, I said there's no better time or place to be in technology, right? I mean, this is the right. revenge of the nerds. We rule the world again, so. <laughs> I like the concept fantastic. of the nerd herd. I think that was awesome. Nerd herd, yeah. That's I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank so, you so thank you. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks. Bye yes, next. thanks Absolutely. so much. Adina Friedman, CEO of NASDAQ. The next person who's going to present is one of my favorite guys in the world. He has, he's a very smart guy, he's full of brain, but he's also full of hair <laughs> in his head. And because of that, we call him hair brain, H-A-I-R brain. Let us invite Mr. Sunil Potty. Today's IT landscape is changing. The era of multi-clouds is here. What if you had a single fabric that could power all of your workloads in just one click and manage them with a single pane of glass? What if you could expand your data center on demand and make all of your clouds core, distributed, and edge invisible? What if you could simplify operations without losing visibility or control and elevate IT to focus on the business? Well, now you can. Welcome to the world of One OS. One click with the Nutanix Enterprise Cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Product and Development Officer, Nutanix, Sunil Pody. So, so um, at least this guy got it right, but uh, Sudish, I've known him for three years, he still doesn't know how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> it's, it's like my son, uh, he's like 
12 now when he was nine. I, I know I told this joke uh, a couple of times uh, for a smaller audience. He was sitting in the back of my seat and uh, my car and uh, he goes, Dad, I love you. We do lots of good stuff and I love Indian food and all that, but uh, why do you have to name me after a toilet? <laughs> so, uh, so Sudish, you know, thank you for reminding me about that joke. Um, so, so on to a mystery, I guess. Uh, this definitely hybrid cloud is a mystery as much as it sounds uh, like uh, everybody has an answer. Um, so if you, if, if you want to ever learn about uh, Nutanix product roadmap, read Dilbert, okay? <laughs> so, so one thing, you know, this is what I, I joke to my team and our partners and so forth is, people talk about the hybrid cloud, but the term hybrid cloud itself is a little bit of an oxymoron, right? Because uh, the only cloud today that truly exists is the public cloud. Everybody knows that's real, it's there, it's mainstream. And uh, how can you actually talk about a hybrid cloud before first do, you know, actually building another cloud? We are trying to call it the private cloud or whatever you want to call it. And uh, once you actually do a genuine job of the private cloud, only then can you actually embark on building a hybrid cloud. And most of the, if I can call it, uh, you know, vendors out there, including us and so forth, I think what we have to keep ourselves honest is that before we jump fast into hybrid cloud, let's make sure that we first do a good job of the private cloud and then expand it beyond that to actually make sure that hybridity works. So, so you know, Nutanix as a company, we have this thesis that look, use the right cloud for the right workload. If it's a predictable workload, focus on doing it inside because that's what things, you know, will work out over the long term. You know, when we come to Washington, D.C., we stay in a hotel for three days, stay here for a year, we'll lease an apartment. If you stay here for five, six years, um, you know, we'll buy a house. It may be in, uh, in Pennsylvania, but we'll buy a house. So, um, and if it's elastic, obviously a public cloud makes sense, right? So the key thing, though, the thing that has actually led us to where we are today, I think, to differentiate our offering from... Uh, Others is the fact that when you build a private cloud, it has to be an exact replica of the public cloud. If not, you're not doing a honest job about providing that same consumer grade experience and choice, right? So, and a lot of our achievements so far, I would say, we've come a long way from software defined storage to hyperconverged to enterprise cloud. A lot of it is based on your own testimonials about where we have come. In fact, that particular quote, I actually got it myself while I was driving down one of the highways in North Carolina between Charlotte and Raleigh, and one of our customers actually mentioned this. And so, this is the kind of thing that, independent of the terminology, this is what keeps us going inside our engineering group, is this delight that we sort of embark on from a customer-partner relationship, so that you know, we know that we're making a difference um, with our technology. So, so today, obviously, we're gonna be talking about the fact that as we have found a way to re-platform the enterprise data center to look just like you know, Google or Amazon or Azure, it's only the starting point. It's only the starting point because we think that the era of cloud is increasingly getting dispersed. Dispersed and uh, into multi-clouds is the term that we use, not just hybrid clouds. But the starting point of that is what we call a simple core hybrid cloud. And that obviously requires a way to burn them together, fuse them together so that as an operator, you don't know the difference between what's actually on-premise versus off-premise. And so before we kind of get into the multi-cloud architecture, something to note is the fact that this is something that we've been doing successfully across a variety of customers. And I just wanted to share with you guys for the first time our largest deployment in the world is, uh, is actually more than 1,700 nodes, it's growing, it's got a great, in, in, in fact, I can't speak over the facts, but I can count the number of operators for this environment on my, you know, single hand, right, from my, on my fingers. But the most sort of interesting thing here is the fact that it's 100% AHV. It's 100% <laughs> AHV. So, so it's come a long way. It's come a long way. In fact, our core product has come a long way. And uh, you know, you know, we're trying to take this to the next level. That's what this uh, conference is about. That's what engineering is all about: is to constantly keep uh, raising the bar. And so, in this world of uh, you know clouds that are getting dispersed, 
We think that the thing that architecture that's powering the public clouds and the private clouds is now expanding, expanding to a layers of distribution, starting with remote offices, branch offices, hospitals, DR centers, data, you know, secondary data centers, and so forth, so that they all look like smaller versions of your private and public clouds, right? So a simple like, example is we have this global pharmaceutical company. They started small with us across two couple of data centers, but they've now essentially replatformed their global infrastructure across all their sites to essentially look like it's one single fabric operated by a single set of folks sitting in headquarters, right? And so we think that this, this distribution isn't going to stop there, though. It's going to obviously move closer and closer to the edge. And uh, this edge computing cloud is not just limited to, in our opinion, things like drones or something like that. It's actually more practical. It's practical in the sense that it's about moving some intelligence onto a, you know, a barge or an oil rig or even a Humvee or a forward operating base. In fact, we're going to be talking about some of those examples today where we think that if you can truly homogenize operations, but accommodate this distribution of clouds is where the next era of cloud is going to be from our perspective. But before we do that though, one of the key things that we'll have to do is this fact that, as you can see, Nutanix as a company was always about software, even though we packaged it as turnkey appliances on day one, we worked with a variety of our partners, like Dell and Lenovo, we integrated with Amazon and Azure and so forth. And yesterday, Dieter talked about how we are actually taking public cloud integration to the next level, where it's just not about homogenization of operations, but the fact that we are actually going to fuse the way that we deliver enterprise apps and cloud native apps in the Google Cloud. And I'll spend a little bit more time on that later in the keynote. But a couple of other things on the flip side, on mainstream infrastructure that we have going, is the fact that that same software that we're calling the Enterprise Cloud OS Fabric is, you know, has been shipping now on Cisco for a while. Any customer that actually uses Nutanix through Supermicro or Dell essentially packages that same software and is able to consume that across the, C, you know, the C series, the B series, the storage heavy line as a uniform fabric. And today, I'm actually quite, you know, quite pleased to announce the fact that we have now extended that to HP. And um, on, in the software side, you know, I, I created those graphics myself. Thank you for the applause, by the way. So, um, um, you know, it's the DLCDs. No surprises there. The most popular platform out there. It's the same exact stack. But I'll tell you something else that we've done beyond just uh, making it available in HP uh, in the way that we've done it on Cisco is that as we move into this software-first strategy, the software-first form factor, software-first consumption model, the thing that we are also doing is to disrupt ourselves so that we can offer you maximum flexibility. So the software that you're able to buy on HP is transferable to Cisco, okay, or vice versa. And similarly, that flexibility will apply as we decouple our software from our hardware form factors and we support new form factors going forward. So that tells you that you know, we're trying to stay ahead of the disruption of going from appliances while preserving the simplicity and the turnkey capabilities of appliances, but making our cap fabric more ubiquitous by en ensuring that the software form factor is uh, first and foremost in the consumption model. So, so that's the sort of like the you know, sort of like the key takeaway there is around this concept of ha having a single OS across a variety of delivery vehicles. So when we come back and we look at this OS fabric and we say, okay, so what's, so what's, uh, what's new? So what's new? And uh, the analogy that I have, and uh, every, every product slide, every product roadmap inside Nutanix has to have a brain, by the way. If you guys uh, have an inside joke, is what the just used, the left brain, right brain. Um, and uh, you know, many of you guys, you know, like I was, I, I was always confused about what is left, what is right. But um, the left, and I've verified this last night, is uh, obviously about you know, logic and stuff like that. The right brain is about creativity. And the way we think about our architecture for this multi-cloud is similar, is that 
you actually need a single operating system that ensures that it powers a variety of architectures, but it cannot come at the expense of having a poor experience. And this is the foundational difference between us and many of our competitors, is the fact that we refuse to acknowledge that you will need 15 different products for 15 different use cases, right? And Amazon, AWS has shown us that you can actually use a single fabric across a variety of workloads, okay? It may not be everything, but it can increasingly, and every year, it keeps growing. So fundamentally, that's our core thesis of our product architecture, is the fact that you can deliver the same experience using the same operating system irrespective of the workload. So, so let's delve into both these dimensions, by the way. That's where we will talk through the, the product roadmap. It's the fact that when we talk about one OS, it is primarily centered around the fact that it can be across any application, any deployment, and so far that's a requirement, right? Those two things. You have to support any workload, any deployment form factor, but you have to do it in an open way. And that's the last one is super hard. We'll talk more about you know, what we're trying to do to con continuously kind of stay ahead of that uh, requirement. So when we talk about any application, let's start there for a second. And we talked about the fact that it's no longer about VDI or Oracle databases. It's all about the advent of you know, developer-friendly applications between mode one and mode two applications, whether you call them that or you call them enterprise-grade or developer-friendly. When you look at what's in our so you know, capabilities that actually make it relevant for the enterprise apps, we boil it down to three sets of capabilities. The first one, in the, at least in the traditional world, is about what do we do to enable quick, seamless migration? And once it's migrated, what do we do to optimize it? And third, how do we keep it on all the time without a high degree of maintenance? And so today, you know, we've been investing in this product. It's in the bow under bowels of the company. It's not a sexy feature like AHV or anything like that, but it's a pretty significant investment from our side and uh, in, in fact, our own IT organization has embraced this in a big way, is that you can now essentially get a product called VM Extract, which allows you to take ESX on three-tier environments, your traditional environments, in a very simple turnkey fashion, migrate that to AHV, okay? So that's first, and we didn't stop there. It's just not a, a V2V kind of tool, but it's also packaged at an application construct where we can actually take a very complex app such as SQL Server, scan, design it, transform it, and push it into the Nutanix fabric in an optimized way. And once it's there, we, you know, we can also go beyond that to optimize the way that we actually secure the data. In this particular case, instead of using hard, secure drives, expensive PKMS solutions, and so forth, in the upcoming release, we will actually support native encryption for all of our core data path. So, yeah, every one of these slides are gonna have like three, four features in them, by the way, right? And we do have 172 sites, so that tells you how many features are going into them. Um, so that's, you know, there's a you know, preview of some of that stuff on the migration side. There's a detailed session on it. I would recommend you guys spend some quality time on VM extract and database extract and some of these uh, core data path capabilities. Now on the performance bottleneck side, another interesting takeaway. So I won't jump into the fact that, oh, we're doing great stuff on the core platform, which obviously we're spending a lot of time on. What we actually did for this year was because we became so mainstream in terms of ensuring that we can benchmark against what is the old versus the new, we actually took a lot of the customer workload data and burn that into a new tool that we are calling X-Ray. X-Ray essentially is a living, breathing sort of benchmarking environment that allows you to essentially quickly assess you know, the Nutanix fabric, compare it to your alternative environments, and over a period of time, we are constantly burning best practices into it so that you can actually test out not just performance, but overall system availability, system health kind of 
tests. So because it's just not about how fast we can run in a good environment, what happens when there's failure, what happens when you have to add nodes, how long does it take to remove nodes, and those kinds of things, right? So that's X-Ray, and once we obviously invested in building tools to benchmark it, we have to spend a lot of time in terms of actually improving the core performance. In the case of uh, at least you know, the networking bottlenecks versus storage bottlenecks, this is pretty straightforward. What are we doing? And everybody's doing this. You've got NVMe now being burned into the core platform. On top of that, from a networking perspective, we're going to fuse in RDMA natively. And both of these, between NVMe and RDMA uh, improvements, are actually landing up in a new platform that we're going to be launching pretty soon, which is the 9030 platform, which is going to be our flagship high-performance platform offering 40 gig connectivity, sub-millisecond latencies, all that good stuff that you guys know about. But this is not the, what I would call the aha of performance from our perspective. Because in the new set of workloads that we constantly see, the bar is being raised. The, where the bottleneck is is shifting beyond storage compute networking to the application where the virtualization layers are where the bottlenecks ha happen to be, right? And so, so from our perspective, if you think about the traditional hypervisors, right, they were built knowing that some of these latencies existed on the storage stack, the network stack, and so forth. What we've had to do, and this is probably the most significant release of AHV since when we came out in terms of feature functions and we've been adding a bunch of things, is something called as AHV Turbo Mode. It is essentially re-architecting the core AHV fabric to ensure that it completely understands the fact that the storage and network latencies are completely dramatically changed. The faster it can create bypass routes, the faster it can multi-channel queues so that the app is actually touching the storage and the network queues as quickly as possible. There's a lot of details here. You know, we'll, we'll demonstrate a few of the capabilities, but this is going to essentially, with a simple software upgrade, give you a tremendous boost in performance. So that's the performance optimization side. And then finally, of course, uh, we have, uh, you know, keeping things on, right, which is probably the most important thing at the end of the day. And here, as many of you guys know, we do sync, async, a whole bunch of stuff. And, um, and we're going to demonstrate a few of these things, but in the upcoming release, we will actually introduce something new, which essentially brings you the benefits of uh, synchronous RPOs, near synchronous RPOs, over a high, you know, high latency WAN. And we're not just doing that from a data protection side, we're also extending that to backup, where especially with AHV, especially with AHV, when many of you guys have come to us and said, look, I think it's great for a lot of things, but we really need to get integrated backup going. I'm sure you guys have seen this on the show floor as well. We now have a ton of partners signed up, including Comtrade, including Rubrik, that have built native capabilities inside Prism for backup and so forth. And to sort of give you guys a quick view about all these capabilities, let me introduce uh, Raja on stage. Okay, come on up, Raja. Let me quickly just log into my virtual desktop and get things going. If you, uh, just like my last name, if you ever want to pronounce Raja's last name, just call him M10Y. Like I-18N. Yeah, I yeah so as I was saying, okay, like, someone going. like you, you know, last name jokes are not the way to go. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 sounds good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you so know, you, so you, still, you still work for us? <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. So what are, what are, what are, what are we, uh, what are we uh, going to show right now? So as you're saying, I mean, look, the Nutanix Enterprise Cloud OS, it's a platform for running applications. And there are three things that any platform needs to do. You need to be able to move your applications onto the platform easily. Once they're on it, you got to be able to run them real fast. And then finally, you need to be able to provide them the highest levels of availability. Mm. So let's start with the migration bit yeah. first, okay? Uh, the extract product for databases essentially allows you to move your SQL servers from anywhere onto Nutanix quickly and easily. The tool's workflow, it consists of four distinct phases. In the first phase, we'll discover your SQL servers, no matter whether they're running virtualized, bare metal, or in the public cloud. In the next phase, when you go to the design phase, we look at all of the config and the performance profiles of the SQL servers, 
and we apply a whole slew of design best practices to really optimize the SQL servers for a Nutanix deployment. Then we move on to the actual deployment itself, and then finally, in the last stage, we use SQL replication to migrate the data from the source environment onto the target. Awesome, man. Let's see so it. So let's bring up the demo on the screen, please. So let's, this is, we are looking at the, you know, the, the console for the extract product. So let me just create a project here. We are moving some SQL servers for an HR application. So I create a new project. And the first thing that we'll have to do is to input a set of parameters that describe the source environment. We have made it super simple for you. So you can see this is pretty much all you have to enter to identify the source environment, some IP address ports and your user credentials. So let's just go ahead and upload that through the spreadsheet. And you know, once we are done, we'll start the scan here. So essentially, it's obviously contacting the databases scan. That's right. So you can see now the, the tool is going and searching for the SQL environments, right? And you can see it's uh, discovered two SQL servers. So let's go have a look. The first one you can see is a SQL 2008, and it's running on Windows 2008. And this one has about three gigabytes of data. The second one, that's a SQL 2014. This one's running on 2012, and this one has about 62 gigabytes of data. If you flip into the databases tab, the tool shows you a view of the different databases that are within the SQL VM itself. Now that we have discovered the VMs, let's go and generate the design. And you can see the tool came back and recommended two SQL Server VMs. And we retain the, the, the guest OS as well as the SQL versions. If I get into the detailed look, you can see that the tool is automatically recommending a whole bunch of AOS storage properties, as well as the VM and you know, compute and networking. But most importantly, all of the database disk layouts within the SQL VM. So a lot of stuff that otherwise you'd have to do manually, all taken care of by the tool itself. We then proceed to deploy the VMs, and when we do this, it will ask us for some parameters describing the target environment. And uh, when you do it in your data center, this will take you about 10 minutes or so to deploy the VMs. And depending on the data you have within the SQL environment, minutes to hours to migrate all of the data from the source to the target. So in the interest of time, let me just cut over to how this all looks like when it's all done. So let me just go and find the project. And you can see if I pull up the deployment status, the deployment's all done. And if I go into the detailed view, this is where you can see a lot of steps, all the way from cloning the VMs to laying down the OS disk to like setting SQL Server up to configuring the right roles to you know renumbering the disk. So basically, it, we have made what essentially would have been thousands of lines of chef code or something like that simple turnkey and prepackaged it from a migration perspective. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, the, the net of all of this is that, look, moving SQL servers from one infrastructure environment to another has always been a painstakingly complex process, taking often days or weeks. Mm -hmm. And in true Nutanix fashion, we have really focused on the mundane, and we have made that, you know, complex task, simple turnkey one click. Got it. So what's next? Well, you know, these uh, applications, right, uh, you know, it's also about performance. Mm. So, you know, what do you think, uh, how many IOPS do you think our cluster is driving? Uh, 50 million. Well, let's I go. That was not part of the script, by <laughs> the way. It's supposed to be 50K <laughs> IOPS. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you, if you uh, look into, we have an eight node cluster, and let's go, let's go have a look here. We are doing about you know, 450,000 IOPS. Let me jump into the storage tab. I think that was supposed to be the surprise, by the way, 450,000 IOPS. Yes, That's a lot. So That's that, a lot. that is a lot. From an eight node cluster, we have been able to drive like 450,000 IOPS. So let me go and take a look at what's going on. <laughs> let's go and see what's driving all of those IOPS. And let's go into the table view here. Uh, we typically end up running some Oracle in our .next demo, so let me take a wild guess. And yeah, it's my lucky day. You can see that we are actually running some Oracle VMs, four Oracle VMs, and you can see these are big VMs, 44 cores and 240 gig, okay? Let me jump into Oracle Enterprise Manager, 
and, and look into the view from over there. Let me just quickly. Uh, is, is this the GUI that uh, Dheeraj developed? Yeah, or, yeah, you can yeah, see like the difference between a uh, prism like and, a, and, a, and a sort of a modern GUI. And, and uh, let's wait for yeah. Oracle <laughs> Enterprise Manager <laughs> Th to load up. Thankfully, he hasn't been writing code on prism anymore. That's right, that's yeah. right. So let's see. So if you go into the, the rack view here, you can see that you know, we have this like four Oracle VMs, they form the cluster. And then if I jump into the, the summary performance stat, you can see from a IOPS standpoint, we're driving about 450,000 IOPS. Mm. And if I cut over to the latency view, you can see all with excellent latency, mm. you know, just about a millisecond of latency. Got it, got it. So this is a big difference from uh, last year. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you who were with us last year at Dot Next in Vegas, we showed you how we run Oracle Bare Metal using Acropolis block services. And in that environment, we were driving about 80,000 IOPS. Yeah. And this year, we are running Oracle virtualized in a hyperconverged manner on the cluster. And we have been able to gain a 400% performance improvement. In a single One software year. update. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, so, so obviously, we've done quite a few things here, right? So, so maybe you can spell them out. Yeah, it really is yeah. a, a testament to the power of our software-defined architecture, right? We get to, because of our vantage point in the stack, we get to leverage innovations on the storage side. We are using NVMe drives. If you look at the compute, you talked about HV Turbo. That's what we are using here. And then finally, on the networking side, we are using RDMA to cut down latency as well as increase throughput. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, if you look at it, I mean, to net it all out, when you look at running Oracle, SQL, or other databases on Nutanix, you have complete flexibility. You can run them bare metal, you can run them virtualized, all with best-in-class performance. So, so uh, what about the last piece then, right? Yeah, these applications, you know, they are not about just performance, it's also about protecting them. So let's jump into the data protection tab and see what we have going here, right? And if you go into the table view here, we can see that we have one protection domain that we have configured mm. uh, to protect the, the Oracle VMs, mm. right? And we used to have one hour RPO in our asynchronous replication. And we had said that with our near synchronous replication, we'll bring it down to 15 minutes. I'm very happy to announce that Actually, with our near sync technology, we have been able to bring the number down a lot lower. It's now, when we ship the product, it's gonna be at one minute. Wow, great. You know, that, that's how we incent our engineers is that I told them we can be on stage for 15 minutes. <laughs> so, uh. so let's go into the schedule here. You can see that it's uh, set to take like snapshots every 15 minutes. If you go into the, uh, you can see the system has been taking snapshots every 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and see if we can, you know, change the schedule and lower it. So let me go into here and let's do the update. All right, so it's. So, so there's some, obviously we, we've done better than one minute. That's the yeah. surprise. Yeah, I mean, in, for some applications and use cases already using this technology, we can bring it down to even lower. Uh, it's at 15 seconds. So let me go ahead and you know, show you that here. So I set it to 15 seconds, and we save it. And now the cluster will start you know, taking snapshots every 15 seconds. So, so actually, so maybe you can summarize the, the impact of something like this. Yeah, the, the real reason that this technology is so powerful is that, look, no matter where your data centers are, uh, your primary could be in New York, your secondary is in San Francisco, thousands of miles away, you could still use this near sync technology to give your application the highest levels of availability. Even if your data centers are close by, so that you could do synchronous replication. In many cases for these mission critical applications, you just can't do that because that would introduce a lot of latency in the IO path. So this technology, no matter where your data centers are, no matter what your application is, provides you the highest levels of protection. Got it. So let's look into what's going on here. 
you can see already we started here and the system is starting to you know, take snapshots at every 15 seconds. In fact, the 15 second is lower than the, you know, the prism refresh timeout. So if we do a refresh, we'll see some more snapshots uh, in here. Yeah, so there you go. You can see like, you know, at 15, at 30, at 45, there you have it. All right, man. Thank you so much, Sajid. Thank you, Sunit. Thank right. you. Okay, 15 second RPOs. Raja committed for it, so make sure you hold him accountable. All right, so, so quickly, so we've done a lot of thing, good things on uh, the enterprise apps part. When you obviously look at you know, where Nutanix is being used across the data center, across public and private clouds, there's a lot of increasing footprint around Nutanix for more two applications or developer-friendly applications. And, and, and fundamentally, the reason is pretty simple, right? Which is the fact that not only do we need to build enterprise production-grade capabilities around storage, resiliency, scale, and so forth to uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry or any of these PaaS applications, we also need to provide a homogenization across mode one and mode two applications on the same operational fabric. And that's the reason why we've had a lot of success with enterprises now not only starting on Nutanix with containerization, whether it be Docker-based or Kubernetes-based, but also running full pass applications such as Pivotal Cloud Foundry natively integrated into Nutanix, and then taking this form factor that we currently have, whether it be a pass fabric from Pivotal or with Red Hat, OpenShift, or third-party open sources, and expanding it to even next-generation AI workloads. In, the, in this particular case, TensorFlow, so that we can actually run it with native AHV GPU pass-through. The one final area, though, that I wanted to talk about in terms of these Mode 2 apps is the fact that, you know, we launched, in my opinion, one of my favorite, fastest-growing features in the, pro in the capabilities, Acropolis File Services for consolidating, you know, file capabilities natively into the fabric. And since its launch, it's actually taken off dramatically in terms of not just production usage, but the amount of optimizations that we have put into the fabric. And so today, I'm very happy to announce for it to go mainstream as well, so that it covers both traditional SIFs, VDI data, but also machine data, is that it's actually going to come out with native NFS support across the core fabric as well. So, so essentially, in a nutshell, what are we saying, right? We're saying that, look, this platform now has evolved. In a few years, it's gone from managing virtual machines to now files, containers, and so forth. And when you really look at the architecture, though, increasingly, you will see that the constructs are more and more aligned with, essentially, you know, we started with the EC2 for the enterprise, or the EBS for the enterprise. We extended it to EFS, ECS kind of services, all sharing the same consumption paradigm. And so, so when we look at this operating system across any application, and we look at this multi-cloud world between core, distributed, and edge, we have to obviously then click into the fact that can we actually have the form factor, can we have the consumption model to support any of these deployments. And we've talked a little bit about the fact that we have this choice of a whole bunch of these options, but it's my great pleasure to actually introduce a strategic partner on stage today for the first time, which is, you know, it's a relationship that has been in the making for a long time, and we've done a lot of exciting things uh, already in terms of truly providing some innovation with IBM. So Brad, where are you? Come on up, man. Good to see you. Good to see you, Sunil. Oh, wow. So, so uh, Brad, every time that I've seen you, you're always in a Hawaiian shirt. Thank you for dressing <laughs> up, by the way. You gotta look classy so, for new times. Yeah, you gotta look classy for us, yeah. man. So tell us a little bit about the relationship. Oh, man, it's, um, you know, first of all, you know, even, even before uh, we talk about the products, you know, I, I think, I've been really excited looking at our development teams working together. You know, I mean, we um, you know, took our power platform with your software stack. I think it was three weeks. Yeah. Three weeks the teams were able to knock it out and get that up and running, you know, and we have that, that on display out in the demo area, that platform up and running, which I thought was a really great thing. So I think that bodes for great things to come as well. Got it. Got as it. we look into the future, as we look at these two great development teams working. Yeah, it must be, it must be all that... Uh, free beer that you have in Austin. <laughs> no, we don't, no, this is IBM, man. Yeah, we don't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we come to have beer with you guys. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about the uh, joint offering. Yeah, so the, you know, what we're, what we're looking at here, right, is we're moving the entire, the entire Newtonic stack 
over to our power platform. So we got the, you know, our power platform with the same uh, enterprise processors that we developed and have in, you know, in our enterprise servers for quite some time. We'll now be running the full automation stack of Newtonix. Um, you know, I think the early results are great. You know, of course, we'll have the, uh, the great reliability of power systems on there. But, you know, we're seeing performance advantages already, too. You know, we haven't even gotten a lot of tuning done, and we're looking at 18, 20 percent performance advantage on transactional workloads. Yeah, especially big data workloads and old TP workloads and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that that um, is, you know, exciting for us, you know. And then you look, look a little bit forward into the future, you know, and we've got the Power 9 platform coming out, um, you know, later on this year. I think, uh, you know, you start looking at that, right, you know, and then the uh, I.O. innovation that we've been doing on that platform. You know, we got uh, PCIe Gen 4 will be available later this year. And you look at, um, you know, our open CAPI interface is a really high bandwidth accelerator interface. You know, I think that's going to be able to bring a whole new set of workloads to the hyperconverged platform because that I.O., you know, it's going to enable all the enterprise workloads, I think, to run really, really well on a hyper-converged platform. I think yeah. that'll be very exciting. Got it. And, and tell us a little bit, though, I mean, one of the reasons why we were able to get this product out so quickly was also the fact that you guys had already done some work on KVM, and then we did all this thing so that the full stack actually now runs natively on AHV. Yeah, a absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what we've done with our open power platform yeah. is, is uh, bring all of those uh, industry standard uh, Linux, industry standard KVM platforms all run in, in a first class manner on the power platform. That occur certainly, you know, has enabled many clients, you know, especially the Newtonix workload to uh, port quickly to the platform. Got it. But, you know, there's one thing I just wanted to say, you know, you had that, that IOP chart up there, you know, 320K IOPS. We, could go, we can go ahead and make next year's chart now. It'll be okay. all over a million. Well over, over a, million. a million. All right, Brad. <laughs> well Thanks, over, thank you. Well, thank well you. over a million. One note. One, okay. <laughs> a million IOPS on one note. <laughs> we, we do need three notes for a cluster, by the way. So we'll take three million IOPS. Fair enough. Okay. Right. We'll give you three. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> So remember that, Brad from IBM, three million IOPS on a cluster, Raja from Nutanix, 15 second RPOs, okay? Those are the two names. Um, so when we talk about distributed enterprise, let me just uh, keep going through this because we have some uh, more demos here, is the fact that obviously distribution matters from a scale of operations. And uh, one of the biggest things that we have done, and this has taken a lot of work from us, is you don't, no longer need three nodes. Right? Only one node and two nodes work. All right? In, uh, in the new release, uh, this can be obviously packaged in a variety of form factors. It'll still be centrally managed using Prism. Prism will have one-click upgrades, both from a scheduled perspective as well as a rolling upgrade perspective and all that good stuff, right? So, so this particular area is not just for uh, remote office branch offices, but also for the next architecture, which is around you know, the edge cloud. And the Edge Cloud, as I said, it's just not about drones or nooks and so forth. We've already done that. It's about actual practical deployments of shrinking the form factor while retaining the same operational experience across a variety of these uh, deployments, whether it be on cruise lines, airline terminals. These are all practical things that we've actually been working with customers on where you can actually package Nutanix software and purpose-built hardware all the way from the edge to the distribution layer, connecting to the core cloud. And there were some interesting stories in the military that uh, we've run into in the last 12 to 18 months that I thought that I'd invite a couple of our friends to come up on stage to talk about them. Chris and John, come on up, man. So before, Chris, we get into it, I see uh, Hercules there dragging something. <laughs> so what is that? You, 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 I just told him to ad lib it, by the way. He may be going over the top. But uh, <laughs> what? So you didn't get a room? What was the? I forgot the line, by the way. You didn't get a room at the hotel or something? I'm sorry? Did you get a room at the hotel? Is that why you're carrying that luggage? It's the Gaylord is booked, so I just brought my bag with me. Okay, got In it. In DC, got you it. don't leave bags unattended. So, wh what is that? <laughs> what is that? This is the Class Telecom Tactical Data Center. All right, so while he's setting up and showing us how Nutanix with Class can actually give you that edge node, maybe, Chris, you can tell us a little bit of uh, 
A couple of stories. Let's start with the first So the first one, um, recently just returned from a military exercise. Um, I was invited to go along with the government customer. Can, can you tell us where? Okay, uh, it was in Eastern Europe. We'll just okay. put it at that. That part uh, of the world. Yeah, that part of the world. Yeah. So what the, the premise was is currently down in Florida, they have a data center um, that is currently replicating and federating services straight into a tactical data center. Mm. So the premise of the exercise is I need enterprise services, though, at the forefront, at the forward operating location that we're going to uh, go deploy to. Mm. So what they did was th they used the Nutanix software. They started replicating data down in Florida. Um, within a couple of hours, they were notified that they need to go and deploy to a forward location. So at that point, all they have to do is turn the system off, power it down, put the lids back on it, and it's 45 linear inches, so they were able to take it on any commercial aircraft. So they flew commercial aircraft. That's correct. And it meets the size requirements that they can actually put it as a carry-on item on that same aircraft, meaning that I don't have to wait wow. for a day wow. to transport equipment. Wow. wow. And so what happened? So then when they finally got to their location, um, they were replicating data to a virtual data center in Germany. Um, once they were able to actually get on the ground, they got into the, everybody knows, Eastern Europe, you've got the small compact cars. They had two personnel carry the entire system. We're able to get in that car, go to the exercise location, and go ahead and start setting up. The beauty of the system is that it's battery backed in, inherently in the system. So they were able to power on even without grid power and start getting services back up and running. Cool. So they were able to provide within two hours local services for enterprise grade services on the deployed location until the transmission path came in and they were able to start replicating again. Wow, wow, that's a good story. Do, do, do you have it up, John? Yep. What does it look like? Where's Prism? I thought you were going to show us some fancy <laughs> screens. You got it on your phone or something? All right, man. So essentially just a, a four-node cluster made up of, of Xeon D processors, 128 gigs of RAM per node, and, and an integrated 10 gig switch that Class Telecom brings to the market. Um, all of these are going through military recognizations, testings, and standards, which gets into the second story. So. Got it. Actually, before this, how, how much, I mean, does, can I, can I, yeah, I, I can touch it. <laughs> I can touch it. So uh, this probably won't pass reg regulations, right? <laughs> Man, how's it going? So Neil, yeah, that, that's pretty heavy, actually, Neil. right? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's uh, he's uh, all right, Big John. You can you, you can get off the stage now. Right? <laughs> so uh, what's the what's the second story? So the second story is Clash Telecom de designs and develops ruggedized equipment for the DOD or rough market. Um, with that, there was a story of an airborne operation we did recently where um, for some reason, the parachute did not deploy when they pushed the equipment out of the aircraft. Parachute didn't deploy, I heard the Parachute story didn't deploy. So what happened was the chassis itself hit the ground probably um, 1,200 feet, about 120 plus miles an hour. And actually, they call it Getting a burn-in. Getting precious software. Right. <laughs> They call it a burn-in because it actually impacts and makes a divot in the ground. It hit the ground. It but this did. Is a data, you know, it's a it's a node. It did. A so the bundle yeah. that they use uh, wraps it in a little bit of, of protective uh, material, and then they put it into a, a bag. That bag has a chute. That chute will deploy, and it makes a graceful landing. I mean, probably about five foot per second, right? Mm. Um, for that though, it didn't deploy, meaning that the actual equipment hit the ground at full force. At 125 miles an hour. That's correct. So what that stands for on the class side is that we develop products that aren't meant to withstand that type of treatment. But what it did do was allow the equipment to be able to be recovered from that site. And we did take it back to the safety area and we're able to power on the battery and the, the router and switch at the same time without any damage. So the chassis itself contained all that equipment. Got it, got it, got it. And so it's true edge deployment. That's All right. Correct. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you, Great so job, man. Appreciate it. Good story. The, um, I, I, we asked for some videos, but I guess they were blacked out. So, um, so anyway, so as we look at uh, you know, those multi-cloud architectures across the core distributed and the edge, and we look at this as a, across you know, any application, any work, uh, any deployment form factors, the key thing, as I mentioned before, it comes down to doing this with optionality. Because in this day and era, every customer that we talk to 
do not want to replicate the lock-in that they went through for the last couple of years. Decades, right? So, if anything, I want to choose the right cloud. I want to choose the right hardware platform. I want to choose the right, you know, hypervisor and so forth. So, whether it's any platform, any hypervisor, any consumption model, whether it be appliance, software, pay as you go, and then finally, as Brad mentioned, any computing architecture as well as a first-class citizen, right? And this is foundational to the fact that Nutanix is evolving beyond where we started as a form factor that was just a pure play appliance to embracing the full optionality that we need to give to our customers long term as they embrace this journey towards a multi-cloud architecture. So, so that was the one OS portion, right? Any application, any deployment with an open approach. Let's talk a little bit about one click. It's the experience, which is what you know, differentiates us, frankly, even more so than our data plane. The fact that we've invested so heavily on the control plane is a is a sense of uh, ownership and pride for us. And there, when we talk about what we have done in terms of building this core IP of a control plane that's single, common, scalable across all three crowds, the first thing that we have done is that everything is now in Prism Central. Prism Central is deployable in one click in the, in the current release, okay? So you can literally see that. We'll demonstrate that when Rajiv shows up on stage, but it's also, essentially scale out like our data plane. Because with the kind of volumes of nodes, the number of VMs that we have to support, it has to embrace the same capabilities of uh, scaling out across a variety of uh, requirements, right? And so this, whatever we have found in Prism Element is now being shaped into Prism Central in that single pane of glass, but it doesn't stop there. Where it's extending, though, is the fact that so far we've always focused on virtualization, Compute and storage in the definition of our single pane of glass. People used to come and tell us, what about the network? And uh, when people would ask me this from time to time and we would talk about it, some customers or some partners would say, well, when are you going to put a switch inside your fabric? Because that's all I need. I need a switch inside my box. And when you really press them, what was the reason? You say, well, I got eight cables going out. I need to bring it down to two cables. And we would give them some money back for their extra six cables. But so, so the real problem, what we found when we talked to our customers and uh, you know, real deployments is not in the data plane. The real problem in convergence and networking, in our opinion, is in the control plane. Because when I deploy something, I'd like to know if something's slow. And if that is slow, because not just because of my storage latencies, but because of my packet loss, to the top of the rack switch. And so in the current product itself, that's shipping right now, we've started that journey over the last six to 12 months where we've built in network visibility as a first class citizen so that in Prism, you can now have a clean, reasonable, transparent view into what's causing latencies, misconfigured ports, a whole bunch of troubleshooting capabilities around networking is burnt into the product. But we haven't stopped there because that's the first step, visibility. The second step, is about provisioning and automation. So when I provision 100 VMs today in Nutanix, we take care of the compute side and the storage side. Now with native integration, it will provision the VLANs on the top of the rack switch. It will update the load balancing rules. It will update the firewall capabilities as well, all within that one click automation. And we haven't stopped there because once you do full network automation, built into Prism, the next step is about how do you secure my application environment? And there, with a cropless hypervisor, upcoming release, you'll have native inbuilt micro-segmentation. And we'll demonstrate that, which is a really powerful capability that doesn't require you to actually build virtual network overlays, but you can still, with, and without having to buy expensive you know, overlay fabrics and so forth, there's yet another tool with yet another management console. This is very similar to Amazon again. AWS or Google or Azure have concepts such as security groups. You provision 100 VMs, I take 10, put it in a security group. I don't pay anything extra, plus it's simple. That's what native Acropolis micro-segmentation is. And this is supported now across a variety of what I would call L3 to L7 partners across firewalls, load balancers, switches, and so forth. And uh, to talk a little bit about the full power of this platform, this control plane, and how they're using it from a small deployment to a very large deployment, please come up, Jamie, from... J from CenturyLink.
All right. So is your mic on? I think so. I hope right. so. Excellent, excellent. excellent. <laughs> yeah, he won't get off stage, by the way. Jamie's one of those guys. So, um, so, so tell us a little bit about you know, CenturyLink. I know you guys have grown a lot uh, across yes. the years with acquisitions, data centers worldwide, mm -hmm. and yep. started with Nutanix in a small way and then expanded dramatically. So the, um, basically, the, one of the key um, view we are, we are looking at is uh, IT operation execution strategy. So um, basically, the, um, we use uh, Nutanix and help us to pave um, um, three simple steps toward to the um, um, accurate and, and um, operation efficient um, um, execution str strategy. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the first step um, we're looking at is um, um, our people and our resource out there. How can we freeze up people's cycle? So what we do is um, um, we actually set uh, Nutanix as our standard offering for our um, Windows and um, Linux workload. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. Once it's in place, all of the new comments and also the existing workload, we can migrate it over. And because we freed up uh, people life cycle, the next step we can do is um, uh, we have time to tap into innovative projects. That's why we do the Pivotal Hadoop, and also we are able to run um, IBM Watson wow. on Nutanix. He always. said that, he, he, uh, Brad, you paying attention? He said Watson, <laughs> he said Watson. So, so anyway, so that's mode one, mode two applications on the same exactly, platform. Exactly, exactly, right? yeah. And, and then I know you have this interesting new project called Get the Red Out for looking forward, right? Tell yes. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes, Get the Red Out, actually, um, um, there is a core purpose that everybody uh, care about. Um, the objective is production stability and operation efficiency. Mm. If you are a CTO, CL, those are your top items. So what we do is um, um, with our innovative um, projects, we are able to set the big data execution strategy to help us identify. Because keep in mind that we are able to run with speed already. So if the speed is high, we don't have accuracy, the disaster is going to be big. That's why we use a big data execution strategy for us to help us to identify and narrow down where are the red zones, how we're going to remediate. Got it. So you got essentially a, a one, two, three plan like you laid out between Basically, server, yep. you know, mode two applications, mm -hmm. and then now analytics and, and yep, uh, yep. data and so forth. That sounds pretty comprehensive, right? So what's next? So. Um, the next to, to future is actually interesting um, because, you know, um, I always tell people, you know, any problems can be solved by money. Those are small problems. However, Nutanix help us to enable and to tap into the area that we can take off speed. And that is something that is, you know, the um, very unique position that Nutanix, Nutanix has that nobody is able to tap into too much yet. So what I tell people is um, future is not going to be there waiting for us. Future is actually um, for the people who get there first. So Nutanix enable, enable us to get there All right. quickly. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, so uh, I know we spend a lot of time on automation, especially on the control plane side. A couple of interesting things, though, that actually keeps us going, frankly, is to go beyond automation. I think for us, more and more, we are becoming a big data engine ourselves. I know Dita's touched on it a little bit. Essentially, over the last two to three years, we've made a significant investment in machine learning engineering inside the company. You saw some aspects of that with CrossFit and planning, but essentially what we're now doing, and we'll, you know, a whole lot of functionality is now coming out in the release coming, uh, shortly is the fact that it can auto-suggest, if not auto-correct, a lot of these capabilities around troubleshooting, whether it be cleaning up dead VMs for capacity reasons, whether it is identifying a bully VM and rebalancing VMs in the cluster, or even as needed to add nodes into the cluster on demand based on your requirements at that point, right? But that's only the, if I can call it the bottoms-up view. The other part, and we talked about this, and this is probably the, you know, a very significant evolution within the company is to elevate operations from VMs containers to applications, and that's where Calm comes in. Calm, probably our first strategic product in the company beyond our core offering of Acropolis and Prism, essentially 
elevates us to focus operations from an app-centric perspective. And you'll see this in whether in every demo, every usage and all, every portion of our workflows are now coming top down from an app-centric perspective, okay? Obviously, we have a very rich marketplace to begin with. We, taught, we, we showed a little bit of that yesterday. You'll see that you know, in the conference, plus also on an ongoing basis, this is a living, breathing organism that keeps rapidly changing with third-party apps, partner apps, and so forth. But the core essence, though, of Calm is around essentially creating this transition of what I call, you know, the CIO to the CAO, the Chief Information Officer to the Chief Amazon Officer, or the Azure Officer, or the Alphabet Officer, by the way. Kind of works. Um, basically, <laughs> Chief Cloud Officer, right? But I think, I think if you think about it, what, imagine your CIO going to your business and saying, look, you can go to Amazon or Azure, Google, you can come inside, whatever, but tell us your application workload requirements. What is the SLA? What's the cost? And let the system recommend, based on the right SLA and the right clause for the right workload, the system should be able to say, is it better to be served on Nutanix on-premise or AWS or Google off-premise? And not only is that a one-time decision, which is I can one-click deploy, I should be able to change my mind or over time make things mobile. So I should be able to move workloads over a period of time depending on how the workload working set changes. So, so imagine the power of what we mean by Calm is in the evolution of Calm, you'll be able to log into Calm, log into AWS, into that account, it will scrape the AWS usage, it will model the workloads just like it's modeling on premise, heuristics around usage, costs, and so forth, and it will say, look, here's a workload, this is predictable, this is elastic, would it make sense to run predictable on Nutanix, this is what it would cost, do you want to migrate? And do you want to do that in a reverse direction too? I'm running something on premise, it's running for two hours, a day, that's what it's analytics, I'm spending eight nodes to do it, is it really worth my time, am I better served running it as a service on Google? So that is the real power of Calm. And to show you sort of, I would say, an end-to-end -end view of how Prism, Calm, this whole operational control plane is coming together, let me bring Rajiv on stage. How are you? Stop. You doing okay? You're out of breath? Everything okay? I thought you were the one out of breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, You're running a little fast I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So what are we going to talk about today? So let's take a look at some upcoming uh, Prism Central features. Prism Central has been evolving into a control plane for all of your data center management, starting from initial provisioning, moving on to day-to-day -day operations, and even scaling to public cloud. But before we can do any of that, we first have to deploy Prism Central itself. Yeah. And we've made that process really simple. Let me just show you that. So over here, I have Prism Element. It's not been registered to any Prism Central yet. Let's go ahead and do that. I want to deploy a new Prism Central instance. We pick a build over here. And now I get a choice. I can either deploy to a single VM Prism Central. That's what we've been supporting so far. But starting with our upcoming releases, we will support scale out Prism Central. So now I have the option of deploying a Prism Central cluster. So let's go ahead and try that. I pick the number of Prism Central VMs. Three is good. Select network with an IP address. This one's good. And that's pretty much it. I can, at this point, go ahead and deploy Prism Central. You can see that a task has been created. If I look at the task list over here. So essentially, in a few minutes, you've essentially got a scale out control plane. In a few seconds, you've got to start. It'll take about four minutes to complete. But that's how simple it is now to deploy Prism Central. Got it. So that's deploying Prism Central. But what about? Uh, uh, applications, how do we deploy applications on top of uh, Prism Central? And Aditya showed a little bit of this yesterday with, with the new Calm interface. Um, the marketplace is where we do all of this now. I have a few applications over here. I have, uh, among other things, a Microsoft uh, VDI desktop. I'm going to go ahead and launch that. This is a blueprint built in for uh, VDI. It's got a few parameters to it. But one interesting thing you'll note is that I now have a section for vGPUs. So, so who, who wants AHV vGPU, by the way? I know there's a bunch of folks that uh, are asking for it. So it's, it's coming. 
So with uh, AHV supporting vGPU, we can actually bake this into the blueprint, and our Windows desktops can take advantage of, uh, of vGPU. So let's go ahead and launch that. Again, the whole workflow, as I mentioned, is now top down from a calm being fused into Prism as an operational experience. Yep, I'll give this a name, go ahead, create the application over here. And now notice one thing I did not do. I did not pick a host for this particular application. Prism Central has a view into all of your data center. It knows what, what your hardware looks like. And we have a new cloud scheduler that will actually pick the best hardware for a particular workload. In this particular case, since it requires vGPU, it'll pick the right node with a GPU built in. And if I look at that, if I look at the VM over here, we can see that it, is, it does have a, a, a Tesla M60, NVIDIA Tesla M60 vGPU assigned to it. It's starting on the Darth Vader 14 node. If I look at that, that's a node with two, two Tesla So it's HV vGPU support, the new cloud scheduler built into the core product, but it also looks like our interface has changed. That's, that's right. So uh, this is a new look that we, have, uh, we are experimenting with for Prism Central. The tabs across the top are gone. We now have a hamburger menu, which uh, lets us have a more scalable visual design, put more entities over here. And it's also fully integrated with search. We can, we can navigate using the search bar instead of the menu, and we'll see some of that as we go along. Cool. So uh, we, we now have this uh, VM up and running. And of course, uh, GPU support in the modern day and age for Windows 10 and for most modern applications is very, very useful. Most of them use 3D acceleration uh, extensively. Uh, I have a little demo over here using a virtual tour of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Hope some of you got a chance to uh, see that today. If not, maybe we can take a quick look uh, over here. So this is actually vGPU rendering on the server side. Right. Using this AHV. is over the network. So some of the slowness here is more due to the network than the vGPU. So pretty cool. We, or yeah. Even on a virtual Stuff. desktop, we can do 3D Stuff. graphics. OK, so now that's provisioning. What about day-to-day -day operations? And one of the most complex tasks that uh, IT admins What, what about, what about the, a decoupling PC, by the way? I have that screen on. Uh, you got to oh, you still have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, one of the things we, we are doing going forward, we have a lot of new capabilities coming in Prism Central. We want to get them to you as quickly as possible. So going forward, we're going to release Prism Central on its own uh, release train. So it's going to iterate faster than normal AOS releases. Uh, you'll be able to get new functionality in a, in a, in a very quick way. Uh, but still, we will align with the normal AOS releases so that if you do want to keep the one stack uh, upgrade experience going, you can still have that as well. But you have the option of consuming at a faster pace. Sounds good. Great. So uh, let's look at some of the more complex tasks that, that IT admins have to do. And one of them is troubleshooting performance issues. So let me search for slow VMs. And you can see right in the search bar, I can see an alert for an Oracle VM that's been running uh, slow. There's an alert over there. I can click mm. on that. And here you'll see something new again. I have a, a graph here showing how the system's been monitoring I.O. latency for a while. But in addition, I have this light blue band. And that is a, a, a graph of expected performance, what the system thinks normal I.O. latency should look like. And we get an alert when latencies exceed the system's predicted value. This means that you no longer have to, no longer have to uh, set static thresholds on latencies yourself. You don't have to go to each VM, say this is what normal behavior would look like. Let me set a threshold. The system will figure that out automatically for you. We also have a couple of possible, possible causes over here. We have a bully VM that's been running on the same node. We also have some high CPU for the particular host that we're running on. I can analyze this further. I get a nice heat map showing that Apache O2, that particular VM, has actually been using a lot of IOPS on the node. But then the question is... And this is a new view completely. These right? are all, new, all views. new views, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, you, you said that we automatically rebalance uh, uh, bully VMs. So mm -hmm. why, why have we not done that in this case? The system's actually been able to say, uh, give us a reason for that also. It's not able to migrate the VM because there's a host affinity policy. There's a policy that we've configured that's keeping these VMs on the same node. I see. So, so let's explain this because this is very important. You know, we've actually essentially built in auto triaging and root cause analysis, right, inside the system. Right, all the way from the effect. We, we went from an effect, we, we, we figured out what the cause is. From that, we actually went all the way down to the policy that's causing that particular effect. So very, a lot of intelligence built into the system. You'll see a lot more of this going forward as Got well. It. Let's uh, look, take a look at one more new workflow that we have. Um, it's on the planning screens. 
let's do planning for this uh, cluster. This is a view that many of you are familiar with. It's our you know, uh, resource uh, runway chart, and uh, it shows what, what runways will look like for various components uh, based on our system predictions. But I also have a new workflow here for optimizing resources. Uh, what this is doing is using the same machine intelligence algorithms that we built in to look for waste in your system. So I have 11 over-provisioned VMs. These are VMs that have been provisioned with more CPU memory or storage than they've been using. I also have 19 inactive VMs, VMs that have not been used for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So here's my opportunity to get some resources back. I might want to send a report to the owners of these VMs showing that, uh, hey, look, you guys haven't been using your uh, resources. Can you give some of this back? And I get a nice report summary with uh, you know, the resource uh, runways for CPU, for memory, for storage, but also a table of my inactive VMs and my over-provisioned VMs. I can just email this off to the owners and uh, I'll be all set. So even after we have optimized uh, all our resources, though, there'll be times when we just want more. We need we need, we need more capacity than we Or have. extend into the public cloud. Right. right, so one of the things that Aditya showed yesterday is how we can use the public cloud as, as, as an extension of our data center by provisioning applications over there. But he skipped over one step. We never talked about how the networks will be connected. How do you connect your private data center to the public cloud? And if you do this in the traditional way, it's fairly complex, right? You set up, uh, you set up a VPN, you punch a hole in the border firewall, you go through testing, you go or through... Or even pay. use Direct Connect or... Uh, direct Connect's point. expensive, yeah. but yeah, that yeah. could be one option. But all of these take weeks, if not months, mm. uh, to set up. What we did was we built some technology. Uh, we, we, we partnered with a company called Aviatrix, one of our partners over here, and uh, made this really simple. Let me show you. So in the marketplace, I have the Aviatrix application. I'm going to go ahead and launch that. To print over here. Let's just go launch that. Give the name. It's called the AVI demo. Um, you'll see I've given a few parameters over here. I've given it my credentials for Amazon. So this is going to set up a connection between my private data center and AWS. It has my credentials there. And it has the number of VPCs I want to create, virtual private clouds I want to create in Amazon. Let's go ahead and create that. Now, this takes a few minutes. This takes about four minutes. So I'm going to do the cooking show thing, and I'm going to go to an already deployed uh, application that I have. And that is the... The AVI demo one over here, or actually the Aviatrix final app here, which has already been deployed. Go ahead and manage that. Launch this over here. And over here, I'd give it which region I want the, the gateway to connect to, so US West in this case. And I also give it the actual network that I want to extend into cloud. So, so I have 10.4.124.0 slash 26. I run that. Again, this will take a few minutes, but at the end of this, I will have done everything it needs to, so to connect to the clouds. So right now, without touching a firewall or any of those rules or a border router, so forth, you're creating a just-in-time virtual overlay network to your particular VPC that you can bring up on demand, bring down, or scale out. Exactly. So in minutes, you have full connectivity between private and public cloud. Um, when, you, when you do that, you can go to the AWS console. You can see the Aviatrix gateway over, here, over there. And I also have an application I've been playing with on the side, my seafood uh, beta application. And as you can see, this uh, particular uh, uh, application has a private IP. This is an IP that exists only in Amazon. And I should now be able to connect to it using uh, just from my data center by just using that IP address. And you can see the application comes up. Got it. Right? I still don't get this joke, but it's okay. Seafood. Keep going. You don't see Silicon Valley? Yeah, I don't watch it. Yeah, you should watch Silicon right. Valley. Great show. Um, so, so, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, let's talk about security. Obviously, we've talked about segmentation. Why don't we take a look at that? Yeah, security is pretty topical right now, with, you know, especially this week with GoldenEye going around the world. And one of the major issues with, uh, with, with malware these days is, is lateral spread. Uh, malware affects one VM in a cluster, in a, in, a, in, a, in a data center. From there, it starts spreading to the rest of the, of the network. And micro-segmentation helps us protect against that kind of lateral spread. Let's take a look at that. I go to my security policies over here. I've set up a few security policies so already. The, the, again, this is all part of the new micro-segmentation feature. Exactly. Um, I'm going to just pick one of these policies to show how this works. A few things to note. This particular policy is in monitoring mode, so nothing's being enforced right now. The system is being monitored to what flows look like. 
I have some lines here in blue. These shows policies I configured earlier for monitoring. So I have my application. It has, it's a classical three-tier architecture with a web server, middleware, and a database. There are some flows between these tiers which are allowed. But there's also a NetScaler load balancer that can connect to the web tier. I've, I've configured all this. What I also have is these lines in yellow. These are flows that the system has detected coming into the application that I neglected to provision, mm. that I neglected to set up policies for. So essentially, there's a corporate health check application that's doing periodic pro probes to, to all of my components. Now let's simulate an actual hack into this. Let's, let's simulate a, an attack. I have a tool over here that, uh, that essentially uses the most common passwords. There's a brute, brute force password attack against the database. So it's going to take the 1,000 most common passwords, apply them against uh, the database that I have. I'll go back over here, and you should see that we now detect a new flow. So we detect. So essentially, there was obviously a, an attack, but in this case, it could be any, any, anything new connecting automatically gets monitored and made. Exactly. Better. One of the biggest problems with micro-segmentation is understanding the flows in your system. So mm -hmm. this, by, by detecting them, by bringing them up in this very nice graphical view, we can show you what your network looks like, and then you can make informed decisions okay. about which flows to allow, which ones not to. So in this particular case, I probably want to allow the health check. I want to deny this hack over here. And now I want to switch from uh, monitoring mode to enforcement mode. So let me apply the That's policy. Actually, in real time, make those policies. Yeah, so we set up the policy now, and you should see that this password hack should stop. Okay. Stop. And, and yep. you can see wow. the time out. It actually worked. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Richard. So micro segmentation obviously has been baked into our product for a while now. It's, uh, it's coming out in the upcoming release. We were pretty psyched about it so that, you know, literally now you can converge both networking, computer storage, virtualization all in one simple stack. So, so as we look beyond this and we look at, okay, so one more thing. Um, we talked about elevating ourselves into the application-centric automation side, bringing clouds together and so forth. The part that I think, you know, and Deeraj has done this a little bit, is about how do we actually sort of finish the journey in terms of solving for all of your requirements across public, private, but also a couple of new requirements that we've seen over the last few years. And that's with the introduction of Zai, right? And so what, what does that mean? So just so that everybody understands the why, is what we're seeing increasingly is that as you do private data centers, public AZs, you're obviously gonna make a choice. You're gonna choose enterprise apps, let's call them mode one apps. You're gonna choose cloud native apps, let's call them mode two apps. And you're gonna choose which cloud they're gonna to go to, using Calm or otherwise, right? And uh, when you deploy those apps, traditionally you deploy many mode one apps and some mode two apps on the on-prem. Mostly it's cloud native on the public side. And as you go through that journey, the number one consumption of public cloud, other than if you're, unless you're an Uber or somebody else, comes from lift and shift, right? Because your cloud native apps that you're refactoring or moving to the cloud, there maybe it's a percentage or two, but most of the real adoption is happening when I'm lifting and shifting my enterprise apps. And that increasingly, as most folks are getting to find out, over the first year or two, is becoming a big pain. Because it is different tooling, different economics, call support, call public cloud support versus your own support, right? It's a different operating model. And therein lies the opportunity that was presented to us is that what if we could help? What if we could help enterprises move to the public cloud, but preserve the tooling, preserve the economics, preserve the SLAs, and that's the foundational reason for Xi, which is about while you can use AWS, Google, and Azure for your next generation applications, build it out, could I actually accelerate move to the public cloud as a service while retaining the same tooling that I've come to learn and love on, say, Prism on-premise? And so that's the sort of like the spirit behind Xi is the fact that you can now extend your data center, your full stack that you're building on your data centers, moving your VMs or containers, gets replicated into the cloud service from Nutanix and provides you the same operational constructs so that lift and shift per se is no different now than moving between one cluster to another. It's, it should be as simple as that.
And that's the goal for us for Xi, is just like you would go from migrating your workloads from one cluster to another or cluster expands on demand, we need to be, make Xi look like a seamless extension of your data center across the network, the data path, and the control path. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing with Xi is the fact that it needs to have exactly the same kind of operations. We can't, you know, sort of like have disjointed operations. That's the point of having convergence across hybrid clouds, right? And therein, again, the operational fabric for Xi is an extension of your Prism infrastructure that we'll demonstrate. And then finally, when we look at the types of services that you'll consume, this, these can't be services that are just random, right? These have to sort of feel like they're a, a natural one-click example. And the biggest use case that we are starting with, from our perspective, the biggest need that folks have come to us with is DR. And increasingly, folks have come to us and said, look, there's two types of customers, right? One is I'm a mid-market customer. I have no DR. I only do backup. And you'll be surprised how many people do that. And then there's the enterprise customers who say, look, I'm investing in a lot of secondary data centers. I've got all this stuff. It takes me three months to do DR. And I still am not sure when DR actually happens whether it's going to work. It takes me three, four months to do a test. I'm not really feeling good about my DR. Who, who actually looks forward to a DR event, by the way? Nobody, right? So that's the premise of Zai's first service is the fact that you shouldn't have to worry about your secondary data centers going forward. It may not happen next month, but over the next few years, frankly, you should be out of the secondary data center business. The more you replatform your primary on Nutanix, single fabric, we should burn in services that extend your data center into the cloud, such as DR. And, and, the, and the way to internalize this is, is as follows, right? I and mean, this is probably the clearest way that one can think about Xi is, you know, we all compare ourselves inspirationally to Apple. It is a full stack product like Nutanix. Like Nutanix, we take delight seriously. Like Nutanix, you know, in, in the Apple form factor, iOS is really the, the core behind all the capabilities that it provides. But along the way, while it provided an app store and you could deploy apps like Calm, along the way, over time, it said, well, I can use Google, I can use this, I can use Dropbox and so forth. But over time, I said, I don't need an app. I just go to settings and I check once and I have iCloud burnt in. That is how we envision Xi to evolve is that it's essentially for all purposes taking the full stack that you have and the fact that you've retrofitted your services onto this full stack of Nutanix allows us to provide a genuine cloud offering that's an exact replica without you having to have worry about lift and shift or complicated operation capabilities. And to talk about how simple we have made this because that is the real power is to really see whether we can pull off one-click DR. Let's bring on Benny for the last demo. Hey, Sunil. All right, Vinny. So let's get into it. Yep. Um, let me bring up the demo here. All right. So uh, today I would like to show how we are going to bring Xi Cloud services to mm. all our customers in a beautiful and delightful manner that you were talking about. So uh, let me uh, act like an IT admin of a company called Waldot. And uh, here you can see um, I have my uh, Calm Marketplace. Using this, I've created um, a blueprint for my HR app, right? So let me look at what VMs are there for, for my HR app. Here you can see I have five VMs. And there's a notion of uh, categories that we've introduced. This is, you know, tags that you can apply on your VMs. So here you can see I have app type Oracle DB. This is my DB tier for my uh, VM. And then I have uh, employee payroll, which is the web tier of my VM, right? So here are my five VMs. I've tested it out. And now I'm ready to put it in production. Now, one of the first things I think about is disaster. You know, what happens if things go south? Um, the first thing uh, when you think about DR is, okay, I need another data center, as you were talking about. So let me look at uh, some of the new constructs that we've introduced here. With Xi, there's a con con uh, concept of availability zone. And that means it's a self-managing uh, infrastructure domain. That's a fault domain. And traditionally, you would uh, treat your data center as an availability zone. Uh, you see, I have only one data center. Mm. So now, let's show the beauty of Xi. You know, how does it help you in getting another data center? So 
I can go here and uh, add my Xi account. Now essentially it asks me to log into my Nutanix. This is my existing Nutanix uh, account at my.nutanix.com. I'll use my test account, vinegilwall.com. Uh, so here I'm logging in uh, into Xi uh, using my existing account. And what it is doing is it is giving my on-premises Prism Central authority to go use my account in Zai. And that's so all. It's been it. paired as an availability zone almost, right? Yeah, in fact, not one, but two availability zones are showing up. So this is two real availability zones, one on East Coast, one on West Coast, and that are, that are available for me to go consume. So this Got is it. a hybrid view uh, where now I have public and private coming together Got in it. one management plane. But the hybrid goes deeper than just the management plane. Um, we have a new concept called virtual networks. This allows portability of my subnets and IP addresses from on-premises to the cloud, so my applications can move over and DR without IP changes. Mm. Uh, there's also a few con new constructs on uh, data recovery and how the data plane is fused together between private and public. Here you see the first thing is a protection rule. Now, uh, whenever I have an app that I need to protect, this is what you do. Right, so you create a protection rule. And, and by the way, while Benny is typing this up, what you'll notice is as part of delivering a native cloud service, it is continuing to keep us honest to actually take that same capability, such as, you know, we got to write log file parsing now, we got to do multi-tenancy from the ground up, we got to keep things simple from how to operate it as an operator ourselves. But from a code line perspective, something for all of you guys should know is that it's going to be the exact same code line for Xi or for NX, so that if you don't want to use Xi, but you want to use the capabilities of one-click DR across your own data centers, all these capabilities that Vinny's going to talk about will flow into the current product. Yep. Um, so here I've defined a platinum protection rule. I have uh, put the source and destination availability zone that I want to use, RPO, how many, retain, uh, how many snapshots I want to retain at what side. And here's an interesting part, you know, what does it apply to? So I can pick uh, VMs by name, that's a traditional way, or I can say, let me filter the VMs that I wanna apply the, uh, the platinum policy to. So app types, uh, all the apps that are Oracle, DB, and employee payroll, these are the two tiers I have, and I click add and I save. So that's all I need to do to protect my application. What happens is now it knows the replication schedule. It, it's, it's actually seeding right now to Xi. It takes mm -hmm. some time. And um, it, it'll make sure that uh, the recovery points are available on the other side. Right. So instead of waiting for the seeding to happen, let me cut over to my production environment here. As you can see, this also has the Xi availability zones uh, included in the cloud. Right. And I have my recovery points here. Now this has been running for, um, you know, we started this yesterday, so this, this has been replicating to uh, the cloud. So let, now let's go to Xi, right? And, and I'll show you how these recovery points appear on Xi. So I'm not right now going to log in to the Xi Cloud Services. Uh, this time I'll use my <coughs> production, uh, production account. And <clears throat> the first thing that you'll see in Xi is a dashboard. You know, this dashboard gives you a clean view of what is your uh, cost so far, as you can see. Uh, the current bill is $206. We were doing a lot of testing on Monday and Tuesday and a little bit uh, on Wednesday, we were doing DR testing quite a lot. Uh, there are no applications right now running there because I'm only using it as a DR target. Let me explore, uh, go to the explore view. This is very similar to what you have in Prism Central on-premises, except you don't see the hypervisor, you don't have to touch the hardware. All of that is hidden. What you look at is your virtual resources. Uh, again, the availability zones are there, the same availability zones, wall.dc, this is my data center. Um, here you can see the recovery points, um, they are there. Right. Got it. So now supposing there is an unfortunate incident, either your data center is down or my app is down. It was compromised or you know, somebody uh, made a mistake. Uh, let us quickly do a failover, right? Traditionally, so, this is a hard problem. Got it. Once we set up the recovery plans and everything, what we're trying to do is to actually simulate a failover event so that we can actually see what's happening, right? Right, so all I did was just click one button. It had a confirmation, you know, this is the availability zone where you want to fail over, and just click. And the, uh, and the runbook uh, that we had uh, uh, created for this, um, where we specified, uh, let me show you how the runbook was created. Uh, I can uh, click on update here. 
And, and this is the runbook that we had created. Essentially, it is saying that you can create um, uh, the layers of your application and what, what order they need to be booted it, up. There are many functionalities here. You can say that you know, I can add a script, I can add a delay, and so on. Uh, this gives you capability just like uh, VMware SRM. It's very simple. Right now, it's actually running. Uh, let's go here. You'll see that the failover runbook uh, has been issued, and uh, there are some tests that we had already run in the past. Right? Let's look at the tasks and how they are doing. Right now, oh, while we were waiting, it's actually already done. Essentially, it verified the runbook. It created a subnet for your IP addresses to be ported to the cloud. And in the VMs, it says it's all recovered. So let's go and look at the VM screen here, right? I'll let it refresh. Um, and there, there you go. So that's one click failover, literally, that is brought into the Xi availability zone, yeah. right? <laughs> let, let, let's do a, let's do a, one more thing before you guys take a bathroom break. Right, right. right. And don't worry about your sessions because we're still here. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, now see, I'm running on Xi and I have to add another VM, for example. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable running on Xi, so let me expand my uh, HR app itself. So I'm yeah. uh, picking the disk image that I have and uh, let me give it a name, HR app. Uh, if I can type uh, web VM4. There you go. Could you make it a little longer? <laughs> no, I'm an IT admin. That's what I like. <laughs> so, and production subnet and uh, categories. This is the powerful concept. Employee payroll. That's all I need to do and hit save. Got it. Now I'm provisioning an application VM in the cloud. So essentially, inside. another guy, so DR, remember we've done all the heavy lifting. This isn't backup. It's a full-blown primary data center environment that you can now continue to use as your IAS infrastructure in the cloud. Yep. And as you see, I can see the console uh, as it is booting up uh, in the cloud. And very few cloud providers actually give us this uh, seamless uh, experience like you have on premises in the cloud as well. Got it. And so, so one, one, one more thing, though, which is obviously, you know, it's a, it's a true cloud service. You want to clap? You can clap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. So we had to build failover natively in such a way that it's bi-directional. And so to really talk, show some fail back, let's see if we can actually in real time solve yeah. that problem. So in well. fact, you know, it's, it's not about cloud-ready apps. Yeah. It's really about app-ready clouds, right? And what Xi is doing is it's, it's actually welcoming all applications, traditional or modern, mm. into the cloud without asking the apps to change. And that's what we have shown here. And your tooling, the way you debug your VMs and all that remains the same. Okay. We, right? So now let's look at um, this VM. And as you can see, the protection rule platinum is already applied. If you go to the recovery uh, points and I refresh that view, uh, here you can see. So now what's doing, the system already knows that it has to revert, uh, it's, replicate it's back. Basically, Notice that the primary data center is back up, and it's obviously setting up replication the other right. way. So now let's log into the primary data center um, uh, where, uh, you know, as we uh, wait for it to boot up. Uh, and we'll see quickly if the replication point, the recovery point, is already there. So I let's see. go there. And, ex you know, you see it's already there, and that's because, you know, it was an, uh, built from an image that was already seated on Got both it. sides. It. It's very and, quickly and, and there. And you look at this in a hybrid view and so forth. Yeah, yeah so right now, let me uh, do the other action, which is, you know, the, the Xi Cloud is not Hotel California, right? Yeah. You can also check out and you can leave whenever you want. Mm -hmm. So here, for that, there's one button, it's called fail back. So same thing, it'll ask confirmation for direction. You click fail back, and that's all you need to do. You can go to the VM's view here, and as we wait for the fail back to happen, let me talk about this hybrid view, mm. right? So this hybrid view, I'm showing my availability zone on premises. And this is the Xi view. As you Got can it. see, all the six VMs are there. And you can see bl billing and everything uh, else. Yeah, so there's integrated billing here as well. Uh, you can click, click on billing. And here you can see, you know, this was the cost of using Xi. And, you know, there's accounts. Uh, we have a one-click uh, ADFS integration. As an admin, I can invite users and so on. Uh, let, let's go back to the view that I have here. As you can see, VMs are already coming back and failing, failing back. Got it. Got it, got it. So this is one click DR, failover, and fail back. Yep. Thanks a lot, Vinny. Thank you. Great stuff. Yeah. So, so as you can imagine, guys, this Xi is obviously a, a pretty company-making initiative as, 
as Dinesh mentioned, it's about reinventing ourselves, disrupting ourselves ahead of you know, what our customer needs and so forth. So when we look at, when you look at this full picture, right, this is where our strategic partner Google comes in is, as we were building Xi and as we were looking at this as our native cloud services, it became obvious that one of the biggest things that enterprises need is the fact that I need to be able to take this infrastructure, not just make it available at scale, globally in all the regional capabilities as well, but dark fiber, low latency, and so forth, but it also needed a, a, a single solution that can be consumed by enterprises for both enterprise apps and cloud-native apps fused together into a single platform. So that's what we're going to be doing there is essentially that when you're running your databases, your warehouse management systems on Xi that you've replicated over, remember the full stack is there, so you can actually take BigQuery or any of the GCP services on the same network, the same data path, you can connect them as if you were running one single environment. And that, in our opinion, is a true game changer from the way that public cloud will be consumed where not just net new cloud native apps, but existing enterprise apps are moved to the public cloud without any lift and shift. So, so to wrap things up at a high level, right? So we talked about this enterprise cloud OS. It's clearly you know, a big you know, evolution for us to actually deliver this as a software-centric approach across a variety of partnerships, all the way from public cloud to mainstream enterprises. And also, at the same time, keep disrupting ourselves in terms of the form factor and the capabilities between appliances, to software, to services. And, and you know, we talked about a lot of things today. Right? We talked about Calm, we talked about Google Cloud, we talked about micro-segmentation, we talked about our partnership with IBM. We talked about many things. And, and if you think about it, as a company that's still growing, it's growing pretty rapidly, velocity of product innovations is a top of mind thing. You've seen this over the last few years. It's continued this year with, between 5.0 with all the hardware part, the platform pieces, the software pieces coming out, including Oplex with 5.5 shipping soon. But the biggest thing that keeps us up and that keeps us going is the fact that we've been able to balance velocity with quality, though, right? And just to give you a data point, one data point, actually two. One is the fact that we keep this on our dashboards every day. Every engineering department, support department has this. Is as the number of nodes have changed and they've grown rapidly, we take number of customer found defects as a percentage of node ship and we measure that line. In mainstream enterprise products, being less than three, four percent is world class. And we've sort of consistently tried to keep it below two percent. That's one, one big example of quality. The other big example that we've always talked about There's like a few QA engineers here, so they'll appreciate it. Um, the other big thing that we've talked about is the fact that, look, you know, we have the world's best support, period. Who agrees with me on that? <laughs> right? So, so it's a combination of support quality that we think drives this machine. It drives us to continuously, you know, sort of impress you guys, bring that delight to you folks, spend more time at the bar versus in the data center. You know, a combination of all things that lead us to this conference, for example, being all about you guys. But I'd like to take a small piece of time to, for us to also thank a bunch of folks that are not here. You know, these are the invisible guys, your favorite SRE, your favorite SC engineer. Who wants to give a round of applause for your SC or SREs? So, so thank you again. I know it's been a long session. I hope it was informative. I know there's a lot of deeper sessions on Xi, Acropolis File Services, on VNUMA, on AHV, and so forth. We'll find you guys later at the bar. Drinks are on me again. Ladies and gentlemen, download the mobile app to build your schedule for today. Be sure to be back here at 5.30 p.m. for our evening keynote. We have a great lineup of influential speakers such as SAP CEO Bill McDermott, Dell EMC President Chad Sakach, and Lenovo EVP Kirk Skaugen. And you don't want to miss Dot Next Fest this evening. We are taking over National Harbor with an exclusive music and food festival right in front of the Gaylord. Enjoy your day. Oh, don't you